So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our conference and to the city of Milan. Uh, my name is Richard Dendy. I'm the chair of the European Physical Society Plasma Physics Division. Uh, immediately on my left is Daniela Farina, uh, who is chair of the local organizing committee. And at the far end is Caterina Riconda, who is chair of the program committee. And in a few minutes, uh, Daniela and Caterina will share their perspectives with you on the conference uh, so far. Uh, the conference is jointly hosted by two institutions. Uh, these are the Italian National Research Council, CNR, and the University of Milan, uh, Bicocca. And we're very pleased indeed that we have uh, the top management of both organizations uh, who are keen to say a few words to us. So in the center we have uh, Professor Massimo Inguscio, uh, president of the CNR, and beside him we have Maria Cristina Messa, who is rector of the uh, University of Milan, Bicocca. Uh, so at this stage I will hand over to uh, both these people to tell us more. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, uh, for me, a very warm welcome uh, to our institution, the University of Milano Bicocca in our Aula Magna, uh, and I think this is, a, 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 I hope, actually, this is a very good start for your very interesting and important meeting. Uh, I've seen that there are many countries, uh, many people coming from very different countries today, uh, to the meeting on uh, plasma physics, and um, and I really think that uh, the place uh, uh, to be able to host uh, such type of uh, uh, ventures is uh, very interesting for a university, as a university has uh, uh, research at its base. Uh, uh, in order to provide uh, uh, a very uh, interesting and uh, uh, edge uh, level uh, teaching. So uh, I hope you are, are going to enjoy our city. Uh, our university, as you see uh, also from outside, uh, is a pretty young university. It's only 21 years old. And um, it started in this place of Milan uh, that used to be uh, the industrial part uh, of the city. And the buildings where you are were the buildings uh, uh, of Pirelli, uh, the tire factory. And, um, and it has been completely renewed. Uh, and I think it's renewed uh, in many, under many uh, conditions. Uh, not only the buildings, not only the spaces, uh, uh, but also the people uh, who are working here and who are uh, doing their best in order to provide the new insights in many fields of research. Physics is certainly one of our main fields. And uh, plasma physics uh, also is very important in our university. It started many years ago with uh, Professor Fontanesi, who is here with us today, who was the previous rector, and uh, Claudia Riccardi, who's, uh, who has a lab that is very interesting. And it, it, it works uh, on basic research as well as in applicated research. Uh, and uh, I don't want to take more time because you have many, many, uh, many sessions and many scientific uh, topics to talk about and not all this stuff. So just a very warm welcome and have a nice and good uh, meeting in Milan. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, when uh, the colleagues here in uh, Milano uh, invited me to come uh, to this opening together with the rector, I was immediately glad uh, uh, to accept uh, for several uh, key reasons. Uh, I myself belong to the this is the vision of the, of the European Physical Society. 
a little bit uh, aside, the, the one involving uh, you know quantum things, and uh, <clears throat> but this is not the real reason. The real reason is that uh, we do believe uh, strongly in Europe and uh, the fact that uh, we uh, have colleagues uh, who work in uh, in the European frame uh, is of fundamental uh, uh, importance and interest. By the way, I also saw in the audience colleagues that I had uh, when we started uh, the European Research Council uh, adventure, which is also another important issue. And I must tell you that in the National Research Council, uh, we have been able to reorganize the recruitment following the scheme of the European Research Council. And I'm very proud that this uh, uh, could happen. The second thing why I am very glad to be here is that the National Research Council is strongly believe uh, in the fact that uh, uh, there must be a, a real link uh, between uh, research of the National Research Council and uh, research in the universities. And uh, maybe the rector uh, remembers that when I became president uh, of the National Research Council, the f my first uh, exit, I mean, the, my first announcement on the policy that we wanted to do happened exactly in this, uh, in, in this aula, aula mania. So this is the second uh, important uh, uh, message, which made me mm, happy to come here. Last uh, but not least, uh, I, I saw that in, the, that in the strategic area of your division, you cover uh, magnetic uh, confinement or inertial uh, uh, techniques for fusion, uh, low temperature plasmas, basic plasmas, uh, uh, basic plasma physics and uh, astrophysical plasma. And uh, these are exactly the, the topics, the, 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 the guidelines that uh, we follow in uh, the new Institute for Science and Technology of Plasmas that uh, the National Research Council has recently uh, put together, combined the efforts between uh, Padova, Milano, Bari, and now I, I don't want to forget, maybe Perugia, so I must be very careful in not forgetting uh, Chi Menti. I see the director <laughs> laughing. And uh, by the way, the policy uh, that uh, the National Research Council is following is uh, a scientific uh, readjustment of things in order to be able to, to compete uh, with uh, the, the great problems that we have uh, in the world. So we created uh, an institute for polar science. Uh, in an hour, I'm going to, to give the green light uh, to a single institute for science and technology in chemistry. So these things which are, uh, uh, you know, strategic. And uh, we thought that to have just a single institute for science and, and technology of plasma, and I think that Professor Fontanesi must be particularly glad of, uh, I mean, of this, is a very important issue because we give, uh, again, uh, an, an Italian house to people working in plasmas. At the same time, there are all these adventures. I know that you, later you will discuss also uh, of the, the, the great programs in uh, Eurofusion, I mean, and so on. So uh, all these are important issues, which uh, now Italian physics will be science, sorry, because there is physics, chemistry, and technology uh, will be more, uh, you know, uh, more effective in, uh, in pursuing. So, uh, I thank you uh, for this invitation and uh, the, the announcement for uh, the new position for a director of uh, this uh, institute for, for plasmas, as it just, I know that it just came out uh, uh, in the announcement last week. Uh, you are all welcome. Good morning. Uh, 
so this was a very good introduction for the scientific part of the conference. So but first of all, um, good morning, everybody. I would like, the, the first people I would like to thank is you guys, everybody that came here. We know that the success of a conference is mainly due to the participants and it's great to see so many people. Then I have to thank the program committee, the local organizer and the EPS work, uh, board because it was very hard work to put together such a big and important conference. And the last but not least, I have to thank the University of Bicocca and of Milan for hosting us. So on the screen you have a reminder of the scope and topics of the conference and it's great to see such a large variety of topics. And for this reason, I'm very proud to be chair of this conference because I consider as important that the European plasma physics community, and not only because we get contribution from outside Europe, takes advantage of this moment of exchange. It is really the occasion to share some exciting novelties in the field and to keep up with the latest results in research. And as we all know, there is nothing like a presentation in person that is effective in conveying a message and new information that allows a lively debate that can help the field advance. Many highlights of this year will be presented at the conference. In the magnetic fusion confinement community, the first that come to mind, of course, are related to their strong involvement in the evergreen ITER. There are other, project and other projects and other magnetic fusion confinement scheme that are still working very hard. And however, scientists in this community are getting ready to new sorry, upcoming campaigns in the near future. For example, next year, the tritium and DT campaign in JET will happen. On the theory side, nowadays, powerful gyrokinetic codes are almost routine, and they allow prediction on the interaction of fusion products with background plasma, as well as many other basic problems. Other exciting... Thank you. Other exciting events in the MCF area is the JT60 upgrade, JT60SA, a joint effort between Europe and Japan involving superconducting coils that is near completion. And I was told they are on time. That is kind of rare in our field. <laughs> in the beam plasma and inertial confinement fusion, there is also a lot of steering since via laser plasma interaction, new secondary particles and radiation sources are becoming accessible while studies on inertial confinement fusion keep improving the performances of the scheme. Also, as a consequence of the discovery that led to this year's Nobel Prize, we can now have access to extremely intense lasers, so the stronger and stronger electric and magnetic field interacting in pl with plasmas can be studied. This opens the way to access fundamental states of matter and plasma that were not accessible in the past. And, and they were in part restricted to the accelerator community, but are also open to our field. It also motivates studies of plasma-based optics. In the low temperature and dusty plasma fields, every year, new and compelling applications on medicine, food processing, depollution, recycling, and basic understanding of this complex plasma are presented. And this year, it will be no exception. Many novelties have appear or will happen in the near future in the basic space and astrophysical plasma community. I want to mention projects such as the Solar Orbiter, a European satellite that will be launched next year, or Europe participation to the Square Kilometer Array Radio Astronomy World Project that will also start to collect data next year. In this field, reproducing in the laboratory conditions similar to space, the so-called laboratory astrophysics studies is also a topic that keeps gaining momentum. And finally, including QED effects in plasma has been the focus of many very recent work. So I hope you share with me the excitement of this field that is evolving so fast and so much, and also of being here at the 46 EPS DPP conference. And to continue, let me just introduce the program committee. So the, okay, <laughs> it's difficult. Uh, the sub, so it was a great committee, it was great to work with them, it's a lot of work, and I especially have to acknowledge the sub-chairs, um, Sebastian Bresnik and uh, um, Kieran McCarthy for the magnetic confinement fusion, Pascal Bro, uh, Bra Bro for the low temperature and dusty plasma, Kate Lancaster for beam plasma and inertial fusion, and David Burgess for the basic space and astrophysical plasma. 
all the committee have been working very hard together, and it was really a pleasure. The local organizing committee is chaired by Daniela Farina and Giuseppe Gorini, so Daniela Farina will talk next, and Giuseppe also is here, so they're hosting us. They're, they're, they, they did, they've been doing great. It's really a pleasure to work with them. Some numbers. So just that you get a feeling of the conference. So we received 298 proposal for invited and plenary talks, and among these, 87 were awarded. We received 80, 832 contribution, contributed abstracts submitted in February. Of these, uh, uh, 40, more, moreover, 40 post deadlines, and among these, 40 were withdrawn, so that we are more or less on the same range. We, uh, among these, we have 83 oral presentation and 653 posters. Uh, okay. July 5th, 733 registered and uh, more today, probably. So it's really very big. We have very big numbers. It's keeping a momentum of uh, um, calling the community to come and participate and share. And we have 42 countries that are participating to the meeting. Uh, in the spirit of exchange between communities and not only in a subfield, we have many joint sessions. So there are seven joint sessions or half session between the different subdivisions. Moreover, we have a joint session with the European Solar Physics Division. A couple of special events that I'm telling here because they were not advertised, uh, I mean, the first one was not advertised completely on the site. So there will be the Women in Plasma Physics lunch Tuesday that is not restricted to women. And uh, <clears throat> after a buffet lunch, there will be a short presentation by Emilia Solano and then a panel of uh, four uh, women scientists from the different subfields will be interviewed by me. And there are also gonna be a poster on the Genera project that is a project on gender equalities in science. Uh, Tuesday evening, there is the EPS town meeting on Eurofusion, preparation for Horizon, Horizon Europe, and this will be chaired by Ambrogio Fasoli. And something else that I'm mentioning here, because it demands your participation, is the EPL prize. So there is a prize for best research image, video, and communication skill in plasma physics. The video and the images have been pre-selected by a jury, but everybody can vote. So that's why I'm mentioning this. Uh, you can vote. And uh, to do so, you just need to go to the registration starting from tomorrow. And then you will have a ballot. Um, and then you can go and, and vote. And at the end of the week, we will have the winner. So I pass the micro to Daniela that will um, give you the more detailed information. Just a very small point I want to emphasize. Most of the things, they're going uh, on schedule. There has been some minor changes. Keep an eye on the website where are all the novelties are, are, um, are given, especially the Tuesday, tomorrow, the BPF session will start at 4 and not 4.15 as it was expected. Good morning to everybody. I welcome you in Milan on behalf of the local organizing committee. I'm Daniela Farina from the CNR Institute, and uh, I'm sharing this uh, honor together with uh, Giuseppe Gorini, who is sitting in, on the first line from University Milano Bicoc. My role now is to give you a, a few information, practical information, so nothing about science, although we are scientists as well, just to, to say. Um, by the way, I am also a member of the, of the board of the, uh, the Plasma Physics Division of the European Physical Society. So about the program informa the information on the program, uh, we, you have, uh, those of you who were able to register before the start of the, this uh, session have found in the bag uh, a, a printed booklet 
with the program, which is updated uh, as for June, uh, the, um, June 21st. So whatever happened after that date is not, is not uh, reported in, in the booklet. Uh, so while uh, there is a conference, for, uh, the, the app for the conference, a conference for me, for which you find the, the, the logo in this, uh, uh, in, on the slide, reports uh, the up-to-date full program and is continuously updated. So please refresh, the, uh, download the app and refresh it uh, con regularly in order to be informed on the real status of the, of the program. The up-to-date agenda and the file listing all the changes uh, since the end of June can be downloaded from the website homepage. And I, I remind you, the, uh, the website uh, 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 URL, uh, URL about uploading talks for, for speakers. Please uh, upload your talks ahead of time. Do not uh, wait till the very last moment uh, to, to do this uh, in order to be sure that everything will work uh, fine. And uh, there, are, there are people uh, who can help you for this task to staff for help and any question you may have. And we ask uh, to do it for, uh, if you are going to talk in, uh, on, in the morning session, do it please on the day before and at, at this, on the same morning for the afternoon session at the latest. So where, we are, this is a map of this uh, uh, floor of the uh, university. The entire floor is uh, for us, for the, for the devoted to the conference. And uh, we are in Aula Magna on, on, on the right. The Aula, the U60-06-0709 are for parallel section. Then there are additional rooms uh, uh, for uh, uh, meetings uh, and testing the, 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 your talks. A map of the nearby restaurants and bars is available at the registration desk. It's a short, uh, um, uh, just a, a, a page with a practical information. So if you did not receive it, please go there and take one copy. And now just something more uh, le less practical, let's say. So who are, who are we? we? I want to just uh, to give you a short of a view after the words of Professor Ingusho uh, and, uh, Maria Christine, and uh, Professor Maria Cristina Mesa, who are the organizers. So the local organizers this year are the Institute for Plasma Science and Technology of the Italian National Research Council in Milan, the University of Milano Bicocca, and the International School for Plasma Physics. Just a few words about my institute, uh, ISTP. ISTP is a, very re is a very recent one, as uh, was said previously. It was founded just in April 2019, this year, merging three long-experienced CNR groups uh, in plasma physics. The Institute of Plasma Physics, IFP Milan, in Milano, which was uh, the, 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 uh, my institute up to April uh, 2019, the Institute for Ionized Gas, Gases in Padova, and the group uh, on Plasmi Lab in Bari. IFP and uh, IGI have been research units under the Euratom Association since the mid of the 70s, so I have a long experience in, uh, in the community, uh, of, in the fusion community, are now active partners in the Eurofusion Consortium. And they deal also with other activities in other fields uh, in plasma physics. The Plasmi Lab in Bari has a great experience in low temperature plasma for different applications as well in fusion. And now, just uh, a few words about the Institute in Milano. I don't want to enter into details, it's just to give you a flavor of the various uh, acti scientific activities uh, that are going on in, my, in, uh, in the Institute, in the CNR Institute in Milano, which are mainly devoted to physics technologies for magnetic confinement fusion. We have a linear plasma device called the GIM for plasma material interaction studies. And then we, there is a group uh, who is going, uh, developing plasma applications to technologi for technological processes. About the University of Milano Bicocca, uh, this is uh, uh, 
uh, a slide provided by the university, so I'm talking on behalf uh, of Giuseppe Gorini for this. The university was founded in 1998, uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's a recent uh, university uh, with respect to the, to the other um, university in Milano, but has gained a, 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 a how to say, a, 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 High rank in the in the big uh, among the big university Italian big uni uh, sorry uh, among the Italian universities and uh, it's uh, uh, we they have more than thirty five thousand uh, students uh, many departments uh, uh, doctors schools so with a lot of courses uh, and uh, a large uh, campus structure that is the one which is hosting us today and for the whole week. Uh, the plasma group, uh, uh, the plasma physics group at uh, the university is involved in education and training, basic plasma physics, uh, plasma and technologies, nuclear diagnostics for fusion plasmas, uh, neutrons and large inf research infrastructures. And finally, just uh, uh, I wanted to mention the International School for uh, International Center for Pro Promotion of Science, International School of Plasma Physics, uh, which is the third group uh, who uh, collaborate, uh, work, uh, which uh, joined us for the organization of this conference. It was founded by Professor Piero Caldirola, who also founded the, the CNR Institute uh, late in the, in the 60s, so if, I, uh, if I may say. Uh, and just uh, as a curiosity, I reported here the first course uh, as held in, uh, uh, that was held in, uh, in Varenna in 71, just uh, to, to let you uh, note how old is uh, the, the, the history behind, uh, behind uh, us. And uh, uh, every year, two or three courses, workshop and conferences uh, are organized uh, in uh, fusion, uh, about fusion and plasma physics. So this is uh, uh, all what I have to say. If you have any question, please do not hesitate to contact uh, the, the, the local organizer at the registration desk. We are at your disposal for the whole week. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank all our platform speakers so far. And, uh, we now move on to one of the most pleasurable aspects of the conference, which is to recognize uh, excellence in our community uh, in different and uh, diverse categories. Do I have on the screen? Right. Um, so we have prizes in four categories. Um, and perhaps the most important recognizes as the youngest people uh, in the community those who will keep this conference alive when others of us have um, moved on. Um, so there is a, a thesis a PhD research award. Uh, there is a prize for collaboration between Europe and Asia. And then we have uh, our two major flagships, the Innovation Prize for Technological Applications and the uh, Hannes Alfvén Prize for uh, Excellence Pure and Simple. So, um, I would like to begin by awarding the um, PhD Research Awards. If, if, the, uh, if the winners would like to step forward, I have certificates for you all. Um, their names are up there. So the winners are um, Michael Feitsch, uh, from uh, Munich, uh, Gard Cantona, uh, Francisco Artola, and Elena Tubman. Yes. And not Tubman, okay. Uh, of whom three are here, I believe. Um, so, <laughs> a jar of congratulations.
I should mention there are other student prizes which we very much encourage people to uh, engage with, and there is still time if you are a PhD student to register for one or both of these um, by simply sending a very short message to the uh, email address the PPCF journal uh, provided. And I do strongly recommend this. Indeed, I insist on it for my own PhD students because registration for this uh, guarantees that your poster will be visited uh, by uh, an experienced scientist uh, who will spend some time giving you an intellectual workout. Um, so we have a, a poster prize. Um, typically, three, four of these are awarded across the field. And we have a specialized prize, or slightly more specialized prize, in turbulence, confinement, and so on, supported by um, Kyushu University, the Ito Project Prize. So um, if you are a PhD student and have not yet registered, I do encourage you to do so by email by lunchtime. Uh, there is also the second annual prize for collaboration between Europe and Asia. Uh, this was awarded to uh, Michel Koenig from CNRS Lully and um, uh, to uh, Lorimas Ozaki uh, from Osaka University and Yasuhiro Kuromitsu um, based in Taiwan and at Osaka. Uh, the citation is provided. Uh, Michel Koenig was scheduled to um, uh, arrive and give a talk, um, but sadly he's had an emergency with his uh, elderly mother, uh, a situation which many of us over a certain age can, I'm sure, recognize and sympathize with. So we now move on to the uh, Innovation Prize, uh, a major prize awarded for substantial outreach with serious practical applications. Uh, it's awarded to Hannah Barankova and Ladislav Bardos, from uh, the Ormström University uh, at Institute of Technology Jersey. And finally, we have this year's uh, Althane Prize, which is jointly awarded to an experimentalist and a theorist working uh, in the same general area. And the citations are again um, provided. Uh, so the winners are Victor Malka um, from the Weizmann Institute and the um, Laboratory for Applied Optics in Paris, and Toshiki Tajima from the University of California, Irvine. And we can now, before coffee, uh, enjoy a short talk jointly delivered by the Althane Prize winners. Coffee. Yeah, it's coffee afterwards, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Daniela. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we've both been to quite a few EPS conferences. <laughs> we know the schedule. Uh, so that a talk will now be delivered jointly uh, in succession. Um, first, I think, on the experimental aspect by Victor 
No. No, I'm going around. First, on the theoretical aspect by Toshiki. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. And uh, I'm uh, deeply humbled and honored by the uh, presentation by you on, on this uh, special occasion of the Hannes Alphen Prize. And uh, I would like to thank all of your audience and the camaraderie of my colleagues here and abroad, beyond this hall. Uh, all this uh, learning from you and uh, collaborating with you made uh, this accomplishment not only theoretical but also experimental and a colleague uh, followed me they will also present those uh, uh, trail of uh, science that uh, we have en encumbered uh, since 1979. So let me uh, go forward on this trip. Uh, also, uh, Professor Hannes Alfen is not a uh, stranger to me. I have known him since a uh, fairly long time ago. In, in fact, I invited him to the University of Texas at Austin where I was serving as a faculty member to have him give a colloquium and I will mention about that occasion as well. Well, this is the one. Uh, at imprint of uh, Hannes Alfen. Uh, he has, of course, uh, discovered of Alfen waves, and he has worked on the cosmic plasmas, and he wrote this textbook, and I bought his textbook. And when I invited uh, Professor Alfen, he wrote his name like this, Alfen. This is the, his signature. To me, this is my name, Tajima. On the occasion of uh, 1983 colloquium, I invited him to give a talk. So it was a deep honor that uh, I am now given in his name to give this lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we are joined with uh, Victor Malka talking about Wakefield and Wakefield acceleration. And what is the Wakefield? The Wakefield is, as you see, this motorboat uh, causing the uh, wave in front of the uh, motorboat as well as behind it. You see this uh, quite straightforward wave. That's usually wake, called wake. We also call this a bow wake. So you have a bow wake and a stern wake. And usually we talk about stern wake, but both of them are wake and Wakefield. Well, there are two kinds of way to excite uh, plasma. Uh, one is the individual particles excited by plasma one way or another, such as collisions, that's called the individual interaction. But however, there is some other uh, interaction which is caused by the uh, collection of slaves jointly working coherently. That's called the collective force or collective slave force. That's the one we would like to marshal uh, so by beams or by laser pulse. Either way, it caused this uh, co-organized uh, motion of the uh, large amount of particles pulling in one coherent way. 
uh, such as laser, in, in this case, uh, coherent photons, uh, which is moving together, not random way. So this coherent motion of the photons help to mobilize very large amount of labor behind uh, slaves. So that's the photons, or maybe charged particle electrons and the ions pulling in certain coherent way, instead of randomly pulling every which way. So in, instead of a conventional accelerator, we have been able to marshal large amount of particles which reside inside the plasma moving in certain organized fashion. And how to do it is the one we would like to discuss. Uh, this was uh, first suggested uh, at the time of uh, iceberg melting between the Soviet Union and the, Rush, uh, uh, and the Western part. In 1956, uh, here in Europe, at CERN, Professor Wexler suggested, that why don't you use uh, broke, broke down material or plasma instead of uh, breaking down the metal surface so that you can't go beyond the breaking of the material anymore. That's one. Two, using plasma, you can make waves which are marshalling again a collective motion of plasma particles instead of individual motion. So this was the one uh, started, and that was deeply etched in my brain uh, through Professor Norman Rostocker, who started to try to this idea in his laboratory in UC Irvine, early 70s, and then I was his student, 73, and learn a lot from his uh, laboratory experience. The right side, I, I categorize what is causing in a plasma sheath, and then we analyze this uh, experiment Professor Norman Rostoka was doing in, in his lab, and realize the sheath is the uh, sort of slow part of the wake. If the uh, phase velocity wake is slow, what we call the phase velocity is much, much less than, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it, on, on the order of thermal velocity, then it, it causes a sheet uh, type of structure. And I decided that is the one of the reasons plasma is still not yet clean enough to organize the collective force. So when I understood that, and I spoke with another giant, Professor Dawson at UCLA in 1978, Nine, they realized that we should embark on the wake, which is propagating at phase velocity much greater than the speed of thermal velocities. Thereby, these wakes are not going to be influenced by plasma's bulk uh, charged particles. Thereby, it is sta stable for a long time, just like a motherboard wakes standing for a long time, as you saw in the earlier picture. So this is a contrasted a two kind of wave. This is the uh, long-standing uh, coherent uh, wake created by fast-moving uh, motorboat. Uh, this is a tsunami wave offshore. It is still st stable, similar to the standing wake field. However, when tsunami wave come to the shore, the phase velocity of the shore tsunami wave becomes slowing down, almost becomes zero on the seashore. Because of that, wave amplitude goes down, goes up because the phase velocity is slower, and also because it's a large amplitude and slow phase velocity, it begins to interact with the shore, uh, shallow water, uh, and become water breaking like this. So these are the destructive wave whose phase velocity is on the order of thermal velocity. That's why the plasma begins to become unstable as well. It, it, this is not the plasma, but it's again the same th idea. So the pl plasma wake field here is driven by the motorboat equivalent of laser pulse to the right, and behind it is a very sharp uh, wake field. And in this case, the phase velocity of the wake field is at near the speed of light, unlike motorboat. Motorboat is not speed of light, but fast enough compared to the uh, thermal agitation of the water wave. So thereby, these waves are, okay, this uh, laser is getting weaker and weaker, but nonetheless, because I'm consuming a laser energy here. Okay. The other uh, interesting effect happens is that uh, there no, no laser here. 
okay, uh, because the laser is moving at the speed of light or near speed of light, therefore, uh, electrons cannot tip over. Unlike non-relativistic large amplitude wave, you can see on the uh, hook size large ocean wave, ocean wave can tip over like this because of the nonlinear force and eventually become white foamy uh, wave, you can see. However, electron wave on the left cannot tip over easily because it's all already moving at speed of light. Therefore, this is a called relativistic coherence. Because the electrons, oh, thank you very much. Oh, now the laser is revived, okay. So this electron, the speed of light, moving together. When we presented this idea for the first time, uh, I encountered this word by Abdus Salam, uh, late Abdus Salam. He said, uh, well, scientists like me began feeling that we had less means to test our theory. However, uh, with your laser acceleration, I was encouraged. So that was what he had told in 1981, and he decided to organize a meeting immediately afterwards in Italy, Trieste, by the way. Uh, well, at the time, however, our uh, envisioned idea was a piece of paper. Although we were based on some of the experience in Norman Rostock's laboratory experiment. However, in 1985, we were aspiring some kind of a laser uh, technology revolution, which actually came with this gentleman, not with her, but him, Donna uh, doesn't look like her, but by the way. Donna Strickland is not like her. Okay, both of them uh, invented the uh, chap pulse amplification, which has launched what was a stagnated intensity evolution of the laser suddenly going up like this because of the uh, ceiling set by the crystal damage when you try to intensify the laser beyond certain limits. So beyond that, it, it has created nearly exponential growth of the intensity of laser, and which has launched uh, various applications, including laser wake field, which we were waiting for several years, and we are very, very glad. And also, this ambition has uh, also spurred Gerard's uh, technology quite a bit, and I, I was very, very glad that uh, this chapter pulse amplification was recognized by Nobel Committee last year. So this made the larger uh, accelerator, such as this kind of size, now into the palm-like accelerator. And the theory tells us that the energy gained by wake, laser wake field in, uh, depends on the particularly important two parameters, well, actually three here. Okay, here is the electron density. Electron density is smaller than the energy gain electron become larger. That's one of the theoretical consequences. Therefore, when you try to gain electron energy, you want to reduce the density of plasma this way. However, one more important uh, other way is the critical density is, should be increased Critical density of the plasma uh, laser uh, interaction uh, increases if you increase the frequency of the laser, it turns out. So instead of a one micron laser, if you employ, let's say, 0.1 micron laser, then the uh, energy goes up 100 times. Energy goes to a KV X-ray laser, this number goes a million times. So energy gain can be million times greater if you go to X-ray. So there are two ways to go, energy reduce, uh, uh, increase by reducing electron density or critical de in density to increase. So earlier experiment, uh, experimental efforts has been to concentrate to reducing electron density. Recently we are suggesting increasing critical density. We come to that point in a moment. And I'm sure that the Victor will show the, his experiment like in a very broad range of electron density. Okay, so. 
So here, I would like to suggest that the how to uh, marshal the increase in critical density by reducing the wavelength of the uh, laser or uh, frequency of a laser, which is uh, now happening again by Ma uh, Gerard's uh, invention. We have uh, pitched in thin film compression and the single cycle optical laser driven uh, coherent X-ray uh, path, which is now embarking f from here to very sharp rise because of this new technology that uh, Muru et al. has uh, coined in 2014. Since then, uh, we are working together to realize this idea in the laboratory as well. If we do master this technology, which is we are still on the way, now the density of the plasma can also be taken in much higher density than gas density. For example, this is the example I like, uh, I like best, which is the uh, nano-hold uh, structure. This is the, uh, my colleague at uh, UCI and Professor Peter Taborek can create alumina nanohole, which is periodic honeycomb hole with nano uh, radius hole into it. So if you can uh, shine the X-ray uh, laser through this hole, you can create uh, basically the, uh, a gas equivalent of plasma wake field into that board, but in nanostructure in X-ray re regime. This is the, uh, one of the, uh, our early uh, simulation studies using, using 1 kV X-rays in a nanotube. This was in a nanotube. Inside here, the nanotube density of electrons are low, and this side is high nanotube density. And the laser is inject, X-ray laser is injected to the right, and the wake field is cleanly excited and confined in nanotube and the wake field look like this. On the other hand, if we contrast with the uniform solid nanotube density case, lasers are spread more, a little bit more. Wake fields are okay, as usual, but not as well confined as nanotube propagation here, and wake field look like a typical wake field, except, of course, in the solid density <laughs> structure. So these are some of the future we are uh, embarking in addition to the gas plasma uh, physics. This one look like uh, plasma because the density of the ele electrons are much higher in the solid density, but otherwise plasma physics is invariant. So if you learn the plasma physics, omega p, omega p can be any frequency. If you increase the density of uh, plasma, then the omega p is uh, greater. But other than that, omega is a laser, omega p is a plasma, and the relative intense size of that is similar. So you can translate that to the gas to the solid. So once you uh, uh, conquer the technology, then you can go to the solid density from the gas density and compactify it. That's the one vision we now have. And we are trying to do in a very, very tiny way, such as the tip of your finger with the nanostructure TV in one centimeter instead of GB in one centimeter. Okay, so that's the one vision. However, other th extreme is uh, we look up our cosmos, such as Alphan has taught us. Cosmical plasma has lots of structures, such as the galaxy and the accretion disk and black hole and whose jets. And if we look at the galactic uh, uh, blazer, which is actually uh, AGN ejected the laser uh, jet, jet emission, uh, it emits, uh, creates a gamma ray burst toward us. And if we analyze that, and we have discovered that the Mother Nature has uh, discovered the uh, laser wake field about the billions of years ago instead of 1979. This is one of the example, uh, I'm sorry, it's missing here, the M82 is one of this object, uh, it's called the Starbird, nearby Starbird Galaxy, M82 X1, which is actually is an X-ray emit, emitting uh, object. And also it turns out a black hole, 
And also turns out that it is one of the three brightest uh, cosmic uh, object emitting high energy cosmic rays as well as X-rays. Okay, there's the three brightest uh, cosmic ray sources. We, we see it, one of them is this, other one is this too. This is the Northern Hemisphere brightest object, M82. So we have studied, and uh, this one seems to be the uh, very good candidate. In fact, Mother Nature is making a wake field acceleration to show us that, well, Mother Nature can do it billions of years ago. Well, this is our model. The black hole is here. The wake accretion disk is around, and the, and the jet is emanating from it. It looks like this. And then this type of uh, accretion disk can turn the, the magnetic field around the disk to be unstable and causes the uh, magnetic field and the plasma collapse accrete toward the uh, feet of the jets where the black hole is and they shake this jet like this. And that's that like guitar uh, string is shaken up and this is the propagating alpha and wave. Alpha and wave becomes the electromagnetic pulse wave. That is the basically equivalent of laser in the mother nature's fashion. And this is a guitar string propagating that way. That's like motorboat stringing uh, way, wake behind it. So this is the way that uh, accreting uh, a uh, disk is causing accretion toward the black hole by uh, magnetic ramping up by differential rotation. And this accreting uh, cause toward the black hole will propagate alpha and wave which become electromagnetic pulse and uh, causing the, the wake uh, behind it, just like motherboard has. And from analyzing this kind of a phenomenon, we realize that there are very large energy, 10 to the 18th, even 10 to the 20th, even 10 to the 22 electron volts. Protons can be accelerated. Electrons are probably much less PEV instead of GEV, instead of EV, uh, extra volt. But nonetheless, uh, the very high energy, both electrons, which become gamma ray, and then the protons, of course, can be observed, and also neutrinos, which is emanated from the protons. So if you are measuring uh, neutrinos, you can also begin to see the pinpointing neut neutrinos from M82. That's our prediction. So in conclusion, uh, we have demonstrated that the laboratory experiment, laser or electrons or ion uh, pulsed beam could drive large intense wake fields in collective force whose uh, intensity is typically GV per centimeter. However, beyond the current technologies, such as the thin film compression technique we have developed, can be combined to cause a single cycle laser, which can also turn into single cycle X-ray laser, which can be deriving solid state uh, structure, such as nanostructure, which can make a wake field in nanostructure at the tip of the finger, TV per centimeter type gradient, which now became accessible. However, Mother Nature has already decided, well, okay, I'm gonna show you the, how to do the wake field. And in fact, we have seen some of the blazers and other candidates of the wake field emanating X-rays, gamma rays, and neutrinos, and the proton, high energy cosmic rays. And one of the brightest one is M82. And next time you look up in M82, you can imagine how the wake field is causing Mother Nature's signal. Okay, here I am. Look, Toshi, we did it first, right? <laughs> Thank you very much.
Ah non. Okay. Je parle quand même. OK. Buongiorno. Oh, sorry. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's really an honor to get this very, very important prize. And uh, I am going to explain why we are interested to use a, a laser and plasma to accelerate particles. So during the last uh, 15 decades, a physicist, engineer, a technician has uh, developed accelerator for two main reasons. The first one is that we want to satisfy our curiosity to answer the fundamental questions about the constituent of matter, about the fundamental interactions. And the uh, second reason is that accelerators are used for many applications, many societal applications, for cancer therapy, for cancer detection, for security, and many others. So why we are considering the use of laser and plasma to accelerate the particles, I am going to explain this very shortly. So it was proposed uh, about three, four decades ago by our friend, Toji, uh, to use a laser to excite a plasma wave and uh, to produce very important electric field. So the idea is the following. If you focus an intense laser beam on a gas, it will be very quickly ionized. And there is a force, the ponderomotive force, that will push the electron away from the path of the laser. We consider the ions so heavy that they will not move during the time of interest, so they will call back the electrons. So when the laser is propagating, it separates the electrons from the ions, and there will be a wake field that will follow the laser. So this is a representation from simulation where you have the isodensity, and when you separate electrons from ions, you have a corresponding longitudinal field that is represented here. So as it was shown before, it's like a boat on the lake that creates a wake field. But here, if you assume that you make a 1% density perturbation in a tenuous plasma, let's say a plasma that has an atomic density that is one-tenth of the density of this room, you already achieve one gigavolt per meter accelerating field. Very important to remember there is one formula, this formula that gives you the value of the uh, plasma wavelength that scale with the inverse of the square root of the density. It's important to remember this. So this was uh, proposed in 1979. And in fact, we did a lot of progress. And this is a simulation where you can see many very conceptual uh, uh, new uh, concepts that occur when the laser is propagating. The transverse size of the laser can be reduced due to relativistic self-focusing, and also the temporal uh, length of the laser can be reduced. Thanks to this concentration of the laser energy during the propagation, you have an increase of the gradient of intensity, so the ponderomotive force will push more efficiently the electrons and will drive a plasma wave in the nonlinear regime. So this is a very important regime, that we discovered in 2002, in which we have shown that we can achieve electric fields of hundreds of gigavolts per meter, even with a value that exceeds one terabolt per meter. So what was the challenge as an experimentalist? It was first to be convinced that we will be able to manipulate collectively all the electrons with a laser and to create this coherent structure that you need in order to achieve the high electric fields. The second challenge that we have to face was to find a way to inject locally electrons to deliver high quality electron beams. Okay, just to understand the problem, this is the, the size of the laser. It's a, a bullet of light with one joule that is contained in a radius of 10 micron. Okay, so this is the distance between the arch is 10 micron, the radius of the accelerating structure is 10 micron. So you have to imagine that we have to find a way to inject electrons in a volume that is about one micron, one micron radius size. And indeed, we have demonstrated with different way that I'm going to show you how you can inject and control the injection of electrons in this accelerating structure and to produce an electron beam that is contained in a volume that in, 
that is 1,000 times smaller than the volume of the laser beam. So this is a conventional radio frequency cavity. The electric field is limited to tens of megavolt per meters, and this is why the accelerator tends to be larger and larger, whereas here you can see that the lens that you need to accelerate particles over hundreds of MeV is only of about one millimeter. So we have discovered many ways to control the injection. I'm not going to show you all the different concepts that we discover experimentally that we propose. You can classify this in two categories, the, uh, that I call the cold injection or the hot injection. What is represented here, uh, this is the longitudinal momentum and this is the longitudinal po po position in the frame of the laser pulse. So in blue, you have the trajectory of the electrons of the plasma, and in black, you have the separatrix, mean the electrons that are over this curve in this trap orbital, they are trapped here, they gain energy until they get this position where they have the maximum energy. So you have two processes, in fact, to trap electrons from the plasma, okay? So the first one is what I call the hot injection, it means that you need to eat locally the electron from the plasma. Doing this, they will gain enough energy to, to go through the separatrix to be trapped and gain energy. The second way is instead to push out, the, move out the electron from here to here, you try to deface them. So for example, you can do it by increasing suddenly the size of the structure which will, which will allow this electron to be inside the trajectory. This can be done, for example, by changing the plasma density. If the plasma density decreases suddenly, you have an increase of the structure. Or it can be done, for example, if you have a very strong self-focusing, and in this case, you have an increase of the relativistic plasma wavelength. So the transverse injection, was one of the schemes that was demonstrated in 2004. And in this case, you can see that thanks to the relativistic self-focusing, the laser, this is isodensity representation of the laser that propagates from left to right. And this laser push out the electrons, the electrons go in this bubble and are injected at the back of the bubble and they uh, gain energy. The charge of the beam is increasing and the electric field that is filled by your electron here is reduced and the process stopped. This is why we have a quasi-monoenergetic electron beam. This was very important result. It was uh, the coverture of nature in 2004. It was called the dream beam. But it was not so stable, so we have to find other way to stabilize the process. And uh, the way that we propose is, uh, that we demonstrated is a colliding laser pulse scheme in which we are going to eat the electrons by using two laser pulses, the first laser pulse excites the plasma waves, and then we send another laser in the opposite direction. When the two laser pulses collide, there is a heating process which allows the electron to be trapped and accelerated by the main laser. So this is an experimental uh, setup that we perform at Hellaway. We have a one joule laser. You have the two laser beams that are counter-propagative here that collide on the gas target here. It's a very, very uh, complex experiment. And you can see here the size of the, the, the structure. It's gas target, one millimeter. This is 50 uh, centimeter radius for the target chamber. Everything is in vacuum. And you have to understand that we need to collide two laser pulses. And the size of the laser pulse here, as I say before, is a 10 micron radius. So you have two bullets of light of 10 micron radius that are moving at the speed of light and we need to collide the two of them in order to have this process demonstrated. So we need to control everything under vacuum. This is why you have a lot of cable here. So this is a view of what's happened in the target chamber. First, you have the laser that is a disk of light, five centimeter, that is focused here. It's 10, 10 micron fixed, fixed this. They collide on the gas proof, produce the electron beam that is deviated by the dipole magnet and impact the centimeter screen. So this is the result. We improve the quality of the electron beam in this process, and we have a quasi-monoenergetic electron beam that is extremely stable, 
you can see here 28 consecutive shots. We didn't filter any of the experimental data. So I think this is very important message, not only for our community, uh, but it's important for uh, uh, plasma uh, physics community. It indicates that we can master plasma uh, even with this range of parameter. So it's very uh, interesting scheme because you can control the electron energy by changing the collision point, and we have a delay line, and by changing the delay line, as I do with my computer now, you can control the electron energy. So we have a stable and tunable electron beam. I show you that you can control the electron energy, but you can control also the electron charge. So we did this uh, in 2006 with two laser beam, but we explore also many of our schemes that require one single laser pulse. And the scheme that I'm going to present you is the following, where you introduce a, a shock transition. So imagine that you have a plasma with two parts, one part at high density and the part at low density. In this case, the laser excites the plasma wave, the electrons are not yet trapped, and then when the size of the bubble increases, as I told you at the beginning, the electrons are defaced and they can be trapped and are accelerated until they reach the center of the bubble where the sign of the electric field change. So the experimental setup was easy. You have a gas target, you put a, a blocker here, which introduces a density jump here, and these are the simulation, this is the density profile, and these are the results where you can see that you can achieve a reproducible uh, quasi-monoenergetic electron beam with one single laser pulse. We also have the possibility to control the uh, electron energy by changing the position of the blade, and you can see how nicely you can control the electron energy. Now we can combine a different concept. Uh, this is just an illustration uh, showing where we are with the development of laser plasma accelerator. So we can combine the injector concept that I show you with a booster concept that we proposed and demonstrated recently. And the idea is the following. You have now a target where you have three parts, high density, low density, and high density again. So why this? When you propagate here, you excite a plasma wave, the size of the bubble increase, the electron are trapped, they can be accelerated. And here, when it reaches the center of the bubble, where the sign of the electric field change, you increase suddenly uh, the density. And in this case, look at this, the bubble size decrease, the electron now they are defaced again at the back of the structure, and they can be accelerated again by the accelerating field. So this is very, very nice, uh, uh, very simple experiment that we achieve. And uh, this is the experimental setup. We add a needle in addition to the uh, blocker here in order to have the required profile. And here you can see you have uh, a quasi monoenergetic electron beam, and you can increase by adding uh, the density jump, the electron energy uh, consecutively, and keeping the right properties of the electron beam. So now we have many concepts, many tools, which allow us to design the accelerator uh, depending on what you want to do with the machine. So, of course, uh, uh, there are many applications. And this is an illustration of few of the applications that we have identified and on which we are working. I didn't discuss the long-term application, but I discussed mainly here the short-term application. Uh, we have shown that it's possible to generate a betatron radiation, which has a very good uh, special uh, resolution properties, which allow to make a, a current phase uh, X-ray image. So this is an image of a bee. You can see the eggs, the body, and the, the, the egg. The, the wings here. We also consider now uh, the use of very high energy electrons for radiotherapy, and we have shown uh, recently that you can improve uh, the cancer treatment by reducing by 20% the amount of dose uh, if you use uh, high energy electrons, those that we are producing today with a one joule laser, and you can improve the cancer treatment uh, better than what we do aujourd'hui today with uh, X-ray IMRT. We have generated a very energetic gamma ray uh, with a source size that is be, be below 50 microns. 
and we can make image of very dense object. This is what we call a non-destructive material inspection. And we have a prototype at Ecole Polytechnique that has the support of uh, companies, uh, uh, industries from uh, uh, automobile, from uh, aeronautic, from nuclear, uh, for nuclear plant inspection, for example. Uh, so we are developing this, uh, this application. There are applications related to this one that is uh, in biology. There is a lot of uh, interest because we can uh, follow how a cell recover after being stressed by the very high dose rate that we can produce today. So this is a very important development that is going to, uh, I would say, uh, give a new push in uh, radiobiology. Uh, and our overall scheme that we are proposing, for example, for demonstrating a compact uh, free electron laser using conventional ondulator or for generating a compact X-ray source. So, I hope that I convince you that by manipulating uh, electrons with uh, relativistic electrons with intense laser, now we are able to design uh, um, the space uh, with a very high uh, component of the electric field. This component can be longitudinal if you want to accelerate particles. They can be transverse if you want to wiggle the particles. And uh, we have identified many uh, short-term applications. Uh, with this, I would like to uh, say a few words. I work uh, um, at Ecole Polytechnique uh, since, uh, 50, no, since 30 years already, and I had the chance to have an uh, excellent uh, uh, team, excellent uh, PhD student, uh, uh, postdoc uh, collaborator at Ecole Polytechnique, but also abroad. And uh, I show you very few results, and this result has been obtained thanks to the collaborator that I have the chance to have. And I warmly uh, thank all my collaborators and also the different funding agencies that uh, support financially of this research. Thanks a lot for your attention. Right. Well, thank you both very much for a beautiful joint production. Um, if there are any questions, Okay, there are no questions, so uh, we end this session and head to coffee. Thank you. Please note that you can exit also from this side. So there are doors open on both sides. Ma no, era acceso. Chi è che l'ha detto che non fa? All'inizio c'è